Hi, today's episode of We Are Only One is brought to you by Mount Gox, mtgox.com, and usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, and Meze Grill, M-E-Z-E-G-R-I-L-L.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode six of We Are Only One. I'm Jude Byrne, and today I am honored and delighted to have as my guest, Reverend Diane Burke, the co-founder and spiritual director of One Spirit Interfaith Seminary and One Spirit Learning Alliance. Welcome. Thank you, Jude. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it is, it is our pleasure. I love one spirit that says so much mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you brought a video for our audience to see a little bit about One Spirit as a learning alliance with classes as well as an interface seminary. Mm -hmm. So we're going to show you a little bit right now to get a feel and then love you to take us through it. Okay? Sure. Thank you. The thrust of the seminary has always been very much on becoming the kind of human being who, through our very presence, invites and supports other people to grow and to open to being in the world in a more open-minded, open-hearted, inclusive way of being. One Spirit Learning Alliance grew out of a deep friendship I had with um, my oldest and dearest friend of 35 years, Diane Burke. And the mix of her, the depth of her teaching about the great spiritual traditions and the practical learning I had about how to operate in the world. And neither of us had planned to do this. It just kind of emerged almost as a natural part of the conversation we've been holding since we met in college and spent 10 hours in dialogue. I think the heart of that work for me has really been expressed by something that Tolstoy said, and that is grow spiritually and help other people to do that. It's the meaning of life. And I think it's that deep sense of purpose that has not only informed everything we do, but that's the common thread that draws people to that program and that experience. I began my role here as um, the coordinator of the admissions process, and it's, so it has been a fascinating journey. Um, from holding the space just for the seminary, for the two classes of the sem seminary, to continue to watch the, um, the evolution of the people that show up at our door. The level of spiritual maturity, of understanding, of even educational background of the people that are showing up at One Spirit, it continues to remind us how we need to evolve the program and what has happened in order to keep evolving the program to match the level of the person that shows up at our door. And it, the program moves, the students move, the program moves, the student moves, and it, it just continues. It's just an evolution. Hopefully we're going to be educating presidents very soon. <laughs> we had some very interesting feedback on Saturday. Uh, we had a new presenter on Islam, and one of the things he shared with me afterwards is what an interesting experience it was for him to be with our students because most of the time he teaches people who are very strongly rooted in a particular religious identity and affiliation. And our students, uh, some of them still have a strong affiliation, but, but many, their primary identification is no longer with a specific religious and cultural group, but 
but with the family of humanity and the family of creation itself. It's very moving to be a part of this community. I think that you're really getting a flavor for this, that this is not a workplace alone. This is our spiritual home, our emotional home. Um, we're not only working on one spirit here, but we're working on our own personal little one spirits together. For us, ministry is a very broad umbrella of which conventional understandings of what clergy do is only one small piece. The other thing that has always informed my own understanding is something ascribed to St. Francis. He said, there's no use walking anywhere to preach or teach or serve or whatever if your walking isn't your preaching. What's most powerful? Mm -hmm. That was great. Covered a lot there. Can you, you tell us some more about One Spirit and the different things people can expect there? We began One Spirit in August of 2002, and the, the idea of it really was born in the aftermath of 9-11, when my sense of the real urgency of this work that can be a force for peace, for understanding, for healing in the world, uh, really began to expand. Mm -hmm. I had been involved in training and ordaining interfaith ministers since 1988, and had been working on developing training programs and, and curricula for that purpose since then. In 2001, I, I discovered that the vision that I had was larger than the actual institutional container in which I was working. Mm -hmm. And it became clear that the right thing to do was to begin a new organization. The name One Spirit Learning Alliance and One Spirit Interfaith Seminary came to me one morning in a meditation and mm -hmm. a follow-up conversation with my friend Michael Pergola. Mm -hmm. And through an amazing series of synchronicities in which the universe clearly seemed to be supporting this idea, we were able to get the organization started in a very short period of time and open our doors in September of 2002. Our flagship program is the Interfaith Seminary Training, which trains and ordains interfaith and interspiritual ministers. Mm -hmm. Since we opened our doors, we've ordained over 600 ministers who are not only from all over the United States, but from all over the world as well. We have students and graduates in Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, South America. Uh, it's really become a global movement. Fabulous. And in addition to the seminary, we also offer courses in this kind of inclusive spirituality and inclusive approaches to personal and spiritual development that are open to the general public as well as some professional trainings specifically in interspiritual counseling and a new program that we started last year in integral mentoring and ministry. Wow, <clears throat> that sounds like quite a very uh, ambitious and beneficial mm. offering that the world needs so much right now. Um, almost the use of one spirit to me is uh, visionary at the time. I think in the 80s was kind of different from, from now and the inclusiveness, uh, which is so important and at the core of spirituality. Um, I also heard that you have um, learning, distant learning and um, online offerings for people who may be out of the country or um, could you speak to that a little bit? Is that, um, would the seminary program be part of that? Yes, it is. Our live classes are held in New York City. Mm -hmm. 
and all of them are actually audio recorded live so that people anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world are then able to download the audio recordings from a secure student website and participate in the program that way as well as in online uh, discussion forums and uh, conference calls, study groups, and yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah, That's great. I'm sure some of our viewers will be checking out your website. Yes, I would say actually about half of our student body each year take the course by distance learning or by online participation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's um, uh, enhanced uh, your offering to, to be able to do that. Can you combine being, on, being in person sometimes and online others if you're traveling or you come yes. to town? Yes, absolutely. We encourage our uh, distance learning students to come to New York for classes whenever they're able to do that. And we actually have had students fly into New York every month. The classes meet once a month on a weekend. And we've had students fly into New York every month from places like Chicago, Seattle, California, London. Uh, and other people come maybe once a year, two or three times a year. And at the end of the year, there is a residential intensive, a final retreat that all of the students come to the New York area to participate in. Mm -hmm. I actually know some friends of mine from Miami, who, uh, one of whom was a rabbi and one of whom was a Buddhist. And so um, they both really enjoyed it, as well as several friends of mine from California who, who've taken this. So I wonder if you could uh, give um, us a little slice of a day in the life uh, at the interfaith. Um, what would that be like? Um, be studying teachings from all various disciplines? Yes, in, in the first year of our training, we consider the first year of the seminary really a kind of personal foundation for interfaith and interspiritual ministry. So the focus of, of the study in the first year is an introduction to the world's religious and spiritual traditions, including Eastern traditions, the Abrahamic Western traditions, indigenous spirituality, Native American and African-based spirituality, as well as some of the newer modern revelations that are continuing, such as 12-step spirituality, New Thought spirituality, A Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, also an exploration of some of the basic psychological principles that anyone who is going to be involved in spiritual service, involved in supporting the spiritual lives of other people, need to be familiar with. In addition to, so actually, so every month we have uh, a presenter who comes in from a different religious or spiritual tradition. Rather than having an academic professor teaching about religions, mm -hmm. we bring in either clergy or life, lifelong practitioners of different paths and different traditions to share the richness of mm -hmm. their spirituality from the viewpoint of someone who is actually living it. Mm -hmm. During the month, the students will be reading about that particular religion or spiritual tradition in terms of its history, its beliefs, its observances and rituals, and also delving into the sacred texts of that tradition, and having a direct experience of the kinds of spiritual practices that we often associate with the various religions. What you find actually is as you begin to explore spiritual practices, you find that almost every religion includes almost every type of practice. Mm -hmm. Yet sometimes in our minds we associate certain religions with certain kinds of practices. 
So for instance, we may think of the practice of mantra, which is the repetition of a sacred phrase or a sacred word with the Eastern traditions, with Hinduism or Buddhism. Even though, again, the repetition of a sacred phrase is found in pretty much every religious tradition. So the month that students are studying Hinduism, they'll be invited to work with the spiritual practice of mantra, mm -hmm. the spiritual practice of repeating a name of God or a sacred word. And they can do that within the context of their own spirituality. So it doesn't need to be a Sanskrit word. Someone who is Jewish could work with a Hebrew mantra. Someone who's Christian could repeat the Jesus prayer. Uh, you know, whatever is meaningful to them individually. Mm -hmm. But just to have a sense of what that type of practice brings into their own spiritual life. In the same way, when we study Islam, we invite people to pray five times a day, mm -hmm. which is one of the central practices of Islam. Again, they're not being asked to do the salat, the traditional five times a day prayer of Muslims, but just to see what effect it has on their spiritual life if they make a discipline of praying five times a day. So our exploration of these traditions is very experiential as well as academic and intellectual because we want people to have an opportunity to have a first-hand experience of the richness and the spiritual treasures that each of these traditions offers to the human family. It sounds <clears throat> like a spiritual trip around the world but in great depth. Yes. And as you were speaking, I, I just feel like you're, you're putting on ancient wisdom mm -hmm. and combining it with, with the, the tradition, but also the thought of now and, and really feeling how that would be. Uh, I can't help but think that that would further understanding and communication among nations to do that. Mm. Yes, I think that one of the things that happens as people study these different traditions is that they begin to glean the common threads that are mm -hmm. found in really the common heritage of human wisdom that belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. We're living in such an interesting time because it's really the first time that these ancient, ancient teachings are widely available mm -hmm. to whoever is really drawn to seek them. I read recently that one in five, I think Americans, but possibly beyond that as well, now consider themselves spiritual but not religious. Mm -hmm. And what they're looking for is not so much the sense of particular identity that comes with being aligned with a specific religious tradition, but that direct experience of spirit, that experience of connecting with the source of being, that is really what gave rise to all of these traditions in the first place. And people are looking for ways to tap back into that deeper river of experience where we really can feel our, our shared humanity as well as our shared true nature or divine nature as well. Yes. I remember the book, One Human Family, was mm, it? Um, the Family of Man. The Family of Man, yeah. yes. Um, in the 70s had pictures of, and it was so soulful of people all over the world mm -hmm. and how interconnected we all are. And, and I think, I would s say in my experience, more than one in five uh, mm -hmm. gravitate more towards spiritual than the religious. I think um, people are finding more heart and soul in um, an eclectic approach of delving into 
spirituality as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, a tunnel vision and, and an absolutism of I have the truth and no one else does. Yes, and again, I think people are, are hungry for experience rather than dogma. Yes. People are less interested now in being told what to believe yes. than they are in finding ways of connecting deeply with their heart, mm -hmm. with their capacity to love, mm -hmm. with the compassion and caring for other human beings and for the earth itself and creation itself that naturally bubble up in us when we do tap back into that source. The Family of Man was actually a book that was very uh, alive in my own early adolescence mm -hmm. and the impulse to that kind of inclusive mm -hmm. sense of the family of humankind, the family of creation, the sense that there is a, a deeper unity underneath all of the religions and all of the religious teachings is something that really has been part of my life since I was a very, very young child. Mm -hmm. I um, remember as a little girl being taken to different houses of worship Mm -hmm. And to my amazement and surprise, I felt at home in all of them. Mm -hmm. But I thought that I wasn't supposed to feel that way. I thought that I was supposed to feel at home in my own religion, which uh, my birth religion is Judaism, mm -hmm. and that I was supposed to feel respectful mm -hmm. in the houses of worship of other religions. But my experience was actually quite different. My experience was that I somehow felt at home in all of the places where the divine was being honored and celebrated. Many, many years later, I came across a couple of poems of the Sufi mystic Rumi mm -hmm. that really expressed uh, that sentiment in a way that that I was so delighted to recognize my own experience. And I'd love, I'd love to share oh, those with do. you. please do. Love Rumi. What is praised is one. So the praise is one too. Many jugs being poured into one huge basin. All religions, all this singing, one song. The differences are just illusion and vanity. Sunlight looks slightly different on this wall than it does on that wall, and a lot different on this other one. But it is still one light. What you are looking for has many names and one existence. Don't search for one of the names. Move beyond any attachment to names. Every war and every conflict between human beings has happened because of some disagreement about names. It's such an unnecessary foolishness mm -hmm. because just beyond the arguing, there's a long table of companionship set and waiting for us to sit down. How beautiful. And I think that that is uh, probably the best expression of the spirit and the intention behind everything we do at One Spirit mm -hmm. as anything that I, could, that I could say. I was just, I had the vision of a table set on the premises mm -hmm. and going and partaking of spiritual nourishment as well as emotional exchange. Uh, it sounds delightful. Um, I have not taken any classes, but I have attended a special event, mm -hmm. uh, which was lovely, the Fire of Grace uh, with Andrew Harvey. And uh, I, said, I don't know how to pronounce the date. Banafsha Sayad. Yes, 
-hmm. She was exquisite. Yes. And, uh, that was a lovely evening with mm -hmm. Ruby. Um, and what you say, um, you know, I think I have worked with um, leaders in different um, thought systems and mm -hmm. beliefs, and um, I've spent a lot of time recently out west working with uh, earth wisdom teachers uh, of a pre-Mayan tradition and uh, I find their words very uh, similar to yours as far as um, the importance of oneness, the importance mm -hmm. of not getting lost in the unnecessary foolishness and really uh, coming to a deeper level of a heart-centered connection that mm -hmm. we are all one mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> we really need to drop the veil of separation right now for um, for the good of all mm -hmm. and the good of the planet. Mm -hmm. and I agree completely and I also think it's important for all of us to recognize that while our deepest nature intuitively knows the truth of that. Our conditioning makes it so easy to fall into creating a sense of separation in, in so many different ways. And that the inner work of being able to move beyond those barriers is, is really the work of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think we're in a time right now where, uh, particularly in the West, where we have such a strong sense of individualism mm -hmm. that learning how to function within community and as members of a community is really one of the most important skills we can develop and one that is not really taught as part of our basic systems of education. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do, particularly within the seminary program, but really in everything we try to do at One Spirit, is to use the process of creating spiritual community as kind of a crucible for people to be able to explore whatever it is that gets in the way of their being able to experience and express that knowing of oneness and that deeper love and compassion that is so fundamentally part of who we are. So we look at, uh, you know, I, I often think that the people who come to One Spirit come because they have a, a very deep longing in their lives to live in this world as a presence of love, as a presence of healing and peace, to have a beneficial impact on the lives of people around them. And what tends to happen when someone feels that longing and says yes to it, is that we're asked to look at everything inside of us that really gets in the way of our being able to do that. Mm -hmm. So all of the places that we tend to shut down, the places that our heart contracts rather than opens, the places where we find ourselves caught in judgment and uh, I'm right and you're wrong and all of those kinds of things are very much a part of the inner work of preparation for becoming an interfaith, interspiritual minister. So each month, as we look at different religious and spiritual traditions, people are asked to look at, where am I uncomfortable with this? Where does this trigger judgments in me? Where is it hard for me to really open myself to experience the wisdom and the beauty that's contained in these teachings? and to just very gently be willing to look at that and see if we can set it aside. Mm -hmm. In the same way, our interactions with each other in community. I sometimes in the first class say to students, there will be many times over the next two years that you will find yourself wondering, what am I doing here? 
There will also be times that you will look mm -hmm. around at your classmates and find yourself wondering, what are they doing here? <laughs> and uh, those places where we kind of rub up against each other, mm -hmm. where despite our aspiration to be loving, to be compassionate, to be open-hearted, we find ourselves feeling irritated and uh, Challenged. challenged and judgmental and all of those kinds of things really become such a crucial place for us to be able to do the inner work yes. that lets us become more transparent to, to the flow of spirit through us. That sounds like a great opportunity for personal growth mm -hmm. and then communal growth. Yes. Which is yes. Uh, very... Now, you mentioned mm -hmm. a, a phrase, um, interspiritual. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, should we watch the next part of the video? Oh, well, that'd be great. Mm. We will be waiting for it to come. But um, mm. recently mentioned interfaith, moving to interspiritual. This ministry is a very broad umbrella of which conventional understandings of what clergy do is only one small piece. The other thing that has always informed my own understanding is something ascribed to St. Francis. He said, there's no use walking anywhere to preach or teach or serve or whatever if your walking isn't your preaching. What's most powerful about Diane's teaching is the degree to which it's heart-based, but yet built on a solid foundation. Too often in our society we have separated our thinking, our feeling, and our doing. And you know, I believe that the great traditions all agree that the longest journey is the journey of allowing the mind to sink into the heart. And only when those two become integrated can we really act with skillfulness in all aspects of life on this planet. There are really two levels of understanding of what's needed in our world today. One is certainly the, the more traditional understanding of interfaith, which has been that people with strong affiliation and identification with different traditions find a way to come together and move hopefully beyond simply being civil to each other, but, but trying to actually engage in conversation where they can understand each other's point of view and worldview a little more openly. But I think that we are really on the cutting edge of something that has emerged on the foundation that that kind of interfaith work has made possible. And it's something that Wayne Teasdale uh, was writing about. And he coined the term interspiritual, which I think is a more accurate description of the approach that we take, which is that, again, our identification is less uh, firmly anchored in one specific tradition and more in the, the deeper mystical river of experience and revelation that all of the traditions grew out of. And from there, we look at what are the, the treasures, as Michael was saying, the, the core teachings, but even beyond the teachings, the richness of practices for tapping into that unifying ground of experience that allows us to really come together and meet in, in the heart. 
And... Oh, that's lovely. An idea whose time has come. Yes. Yes. Yes, I think that part of the impetus for our starting one spirit is that emergence that I was speaking of there, of the movement from more traditional expressions of interfaith, which were uh, really grew out of a kind of dialogue in which people of different religious backgrounds wanted to come together to understand each other's beliefs, uh, observances, ways of understanding the world. And those efforts clearly are still incredibly important and necessary in our world today. But a beginning desire that people engaged in that work began to feel to be able to join to together at a deeper level of encounter and a deeper level of actual spiritual experience. Every one of the religious traditions grew out of the revelation either of the particular founder of that religion or a group of uh, sages who had that experience of directly tapping into that oneness, into that unity of being that really is the source from which all of creation arises. And each one of them developed methods, if you will, practices to try to help other people have that same deep experience. Mm -hmm. As people began to get to know each other better, some of these interfaith leaders, they began to recognize that at the deepest levels of their respective spiritual practices, the reality that they were encountering was really one and the same. And that they could begin to learn from each other's practices in ways that could enhance their own understanding and their own ability to tap into those, those deeper states. That sharing of practices across traditions, that sharing of experience, is what Wayne Teasdale, in, in his amazing book, The Mystic Heart, uh, referred to as interspirituality or intermysticism. Mm. And what he says in that book is that mysticism itself is, in a sense, the universal religion mm -hmm. of humankind. Mm -hmm. And that intermysticism or interspirituality will be the spirituality of the third millennium. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, uh, the sense in me and in Michael and the others who joined with us to start one spirit really reflected the desire to move from an emphasis primarily on interfaith mm -hmm. to a stronger primary emphasis on interspirituality. And again, I think in the experience of many, many people now, particularly people who consider themselves spiritual but not religious, mm -hmm. that sense of finding value from exploring deeply a variety of practices from across traditions has really opened up their own spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've been an interspiritual, intermystic for a long time yeah. and not aware of it. And I'm really resonating with this mm. concept and energy and consciousness. Mm. And I think many people who have been seekers mm. um, will totally identify with this and, and benefit from it and, and with the world, the communications with the internet and all the exchanges and dialogues 
to me. It just seems so rich mm. um, and such an important concept as we, um, when we need that unity consciousness that we are one. And, and that consciousness, only one TV, is, that's what it means, that we are all one. Yes. And we are only one is the name of the show. <laughs> yes. And um, I thank you for enriching that concept uh, for me, that inter-spirit mm. and intermystic too. Uh, because it, it, to me, it, it was always so presumptuous that one group would have the answers uh, to the exclusion of everyone else. Yes. You know? Um, so I'd, I'd love to continue this. And right now I need to break and thank our sponsors yes. for allowing us to share and have mm -hmm. you here. So today um, I'd like to thank Mount Gox, mtgox.com. It is an online exchange services for Bitcoins. They now take euros, uh, the British pound, the Australian dollar, and the Canadian dollar is coming very soon. And usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, our trusted advisor for investments in rare gold and silver coins. Andy takes a hands-on approach and he will help you and take the mystery out of buying silver and gold. So you can call him directly for the current inventory at 1-800-HOT-COIN. And Meze Grill, M-E-Z-E-G-R-I-L-L.com, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. They are now serving breakfast. I can personally testify they have delicious food, very healthy, uh, hummus, tabbouleh, um, all Mediterranean delights we often eat there. And they are located at 8th Avenue and 55th Street in New York, just a couple of blocks south of Columbus Circle. So mm -hmm. thank you all. Mm -hmm. Interspirit mm -hmm. and the third millennium. What do you see and feel about that? I think that we're really, um, as many people have, have been feeling and have said, that we are on the cusp of a new evolutionary expression and movement of consciousness that will take uh, that experience of oneness or unity mm -hmm. and bring it to a level of expression in our day-to-day -day lives that we can barely even imagine at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. I love the metaphor of m the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly that from the standpoint of a caterpillar, there's no way to imagine life as a butterfly. <laughs> In fact, a, a dear friend of mine showed me a cartoon a few years ago that I love that was two caterpillars walking along the ground and a butterfly passes overhead. And one of the caterpillars turns to the other and says, you're never gonna get me up in one of those things. <laughs> And I think that, that there are parts of us that resist the, the call to growth that is really happening on the earth right now. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I love in the scientific description of that process of metamorphosis is that at a certain point in the life cycle of the caterpillar, cells begin to emerge in the caterpillar that are called imaginal cells. Mm -hmm. And these cells contain the blueprint, the DNA blueprint of the butterfly rather than of the caterpillar. Mm -hmm.
the immune system of the caterpillar reacts to them as if they're foreign uh, invading cells and attacks and destroys them. But they continue to be uh, generated, generated mm -hmm. and then they begin to cluster together. And as they cluster together, they grow in strength so that the caterpillar's immune system can no longer overpower and destroy them. Mm. And in fact, the immune system, the defenses of the caterpillar break down and the process of transformation of caterpillar into butterfly is set in motion. I think we are very much at that time in, in our history right now that, uh, that there is a sense of a new humanity, mm -hmm. a sense of a new consciousness mm -hmm. that is wanting to be born on the earth. It has been prophesied in many of the religious traditions. Mm -hmm. And as people wake up to the, the kind of sense within themselves of wanting to grow into something more, wanting to grow into the fullness of their, their being and to understand what it really means to be a full human being. They are gravitating and finding other people who share that same impulse and those same feelings and are beginning to come together so that we are, I believe, individually, but also coming together in collectives to help midwife this new birth. Mm. I think that uh, people who are drawn to the kind of ministry that we train people for are people who feel very much a desire to be midwives Mm -hmm. to that spiritual unfolding mm -hmm. on the planet and, and in the lives of, of the people around them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand that ministry is really a very, very broad expression. It is not at all limited to what we think of as a traditional clergy person standing in a pulpit and preaching on Sunday mornings or Friday nights or Thursday nights or whenever the, the religious gathering is. That, that ministry really is about spiritual service and being, as I said, a midwife to this new consciousness that's wanting to be born. Mm -hmm. So for, for example, what you're doing with this show is an expression of authentic ministry because you're helping uh, other people to wake up and to pay attention to what's stirring inside of them. I also think that another part of what's happening right now at this moment in history is the necessary integration of our spirituality into our daily lives. Mm -hmm. That spiritual awakening can no longer be something that only happens in monasteries or on mountaintops, that it really needs to be brought right into the midst of our lives in this world mm -hmm. and into engagement on behalf of justice, on behalf of compassion that can really address the enormity of suffering that exists in our world today. So I think it's a time that we are also being asked to uh, find ways of marrying our mm -hmm. spiritual lives with our engagement in the world as agents of change and transformation not only in the inner realms, but in the very institutions and social structures that exist in our world as well. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And you said so many things that touched so many bing, bing, bing um, 
I want to thank you for your comment about the show. That is the intention of um, Bruce Wagner and Ed Gell and myself and anyone connected to Only One TV. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure the intention of One Spirit as well mm -hmm. is, is providing practical tools as well as spiritual insights and um, teachings, having guests like you, um, and bringing the sense of community together uh, in whatever medium that is, if it's online, if it's in person, if it's at a community event, uh, education like the Learning Alliance provides, but realizing that we are one and we, you know, we need each other too. We're here to help each other, we're here to love, and. Um, uh, not just um, follow our own path, if you will, uh, in the inner direction, which of course is key to realizing that we are all interconnected, but also as you were speaking about mm -hmm. taking it to the community and um, having the tools and the realization uh, and helping, sharing the light with others who may, for their, because of their um, worldly situation, mm -hmm. may, may not see the light as easily at this particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard the phrase um, sacred activism mm -hmm. uh, used, uh, in particular by Andrew Harvey, who I know is a, a colleague and a dear mm -hmm. friend of yours. Yes. Um, I wonder if you could, I'm sure that uh, One Spirit um, does a lot of community outreach and sacred service and mm -hmm. sacred activism. I wonder if you'd comment a little bit on that. There are a variety of expressions that uh, One Spirit as an organization, but also that our, uh, our graduates are engaged in. Uh, one of the projects we were involved in last year was working with an organization in New York City that deals particularly with the elderly homeless mm -hmm. to provide them with clothing. Uh, there's very few organizations that deal with that specific population mm -hmm. and that's one of the uh, projects that One Spirit as a community has supported. Mm. Our graduates have been involved in working in many parts of the world. We have one graduate who uh, has been doing a lot of work in Haiti, mm -hmm. particularly with the young girls who are part of a system, I believe, called the Restavik system, where uh, young girls are basically sold into almost like indentured servitude with mm. the promise that the families they'll work they'll be working for will educate them, but often that does not actually happen. And this one graduate of ours has started an organization to work with girls in that situation in Haiti. Mm. Another one of our graduates uh, is part of an organization that works in a hospital in Uganda teaching, uh, the hospital specializes in the treatment of TB and uh, this woman teaches self-care to the hospital staff. We've had other graduates who've been part of groups that have gone to the Congo to work with the women who have been uh, the victims of, of the really systematic mm -hmm. rape that mm -hmm. has been yeah. used as a, as a terror tactic there. Mm -hmm. So there are many different expressions that, that people have, but I think that the uh, the understanding is that spirituality is incomplete unless it expresses itself in loving service and tangible expressions of compassion in the world. So our, our students are expected to be engaged in some form of community service throughout their, their two years of study. Mm -hmm. And uh, many 
of the, the courses that we've taught over the years in our public offerings have also been centered on uh, what, you're, what you described as sacred activism, Andrew Harvey's work. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very blessed to be a part of the core faculty of Andrew's Institute for Sacred Activism, which is in, located in Oak Park, Illinois. Wonderful. He's going to grace us with his presence in December. Wonderful. Um, we're closing in, and I wanted um, to mention, uh, I'm not sure of the date, but I know there's an open house coming up. Uh, if you could tell people. Yes, the open house yeah. is on Wednesday, August 17th. Mm -hmm. The program begins at 6.30. There is information on our website which is www.onespiritinterfaith.org. People can pre-register for the open house. That's helpful for us mm -hmm. in knowing how many people to plan for. Uh, our next series of classes begins in September, so I would really encourage anyone who feels moved by what we've been talking about today and feels a sense of longing to be of service in this world, even if they don't know how that, what form that service is going to take, mm -hmm. to visit our website and to consider this particular training. It is profoundly transformative and life-changing for everyone who goes through the training program. I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling drawn to it myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, do we have another clip of um, we'd like to show people? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what this clip is? I think this is uh, just the uh, it's the closing of the video clip that we've been looking at, and it has some final scenes from our commencement ceremony, which is our public celebration oh. uh, of our newly ordained ministers, and typically it's held at the glorious Riverside Church oh, here in New York City. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Feel we have graduated mm -hmm. <laughs> in the spirit. Mm -hmm. It has been such an honor and a blessing to have you here as our guest. I hope you will come back again and I would share love more. To. Mm -hmm. and, uh, would you like to close us out with uh, some blessing, mm -hmm. some words of love for all those listening? My deepest prayer for the whole of the human family and through us for the whole of this magnificent and beautiful and bountiful creation in our lifetime may the love of power be replaced by the power to love. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Thank you. And I, I was thinking of something which is actually very similar to that. It's a poem I read this morning uh, by Hafez. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, the sun never asks. And it's the sun talking to the earth. And it says, the sun never asks the earth to say thank you, or you owe me. With a love like that, it can light up the whole world. I sort of paraphrased it, but it's very close mm -hmm. in embracing through love that we are one. Yes. So 
We send our love to everyone. Have a beautiful day. Many blessings. Namaste.